All right. Thank you so much for coming. Welcome. I wanted to introduce our panel, uh, Lauren Bissom. Uh, Lauren's an editor uh, at Marvel Entertainment. She works on um, on uh, Marvel's juvenile publishing program. She helps shepherd stories featuring Marvel's mightiest superheroes to readers of every age. And before Marvel, Lauren was an editor at DC Comics, where she helped launch Zoom and, and Inc., their line of original graphic novels for young readers. Uh, Lauren was also at Henry Holt Books for Young Readers and at Little Simon. Uh, so she's worked on everything from board books to YA novels. Hello. Russ Buss is a uh, senior editor of licensing and entertainment at Abrams, and he is edited across most categories of kids' books. Uh, Russ has worked on behind the scenes nonfiction books about Star Wars and the Marvel Cinematic Universe, a series of original fiction novels featuring Flash um, with Barry Liga, as well as a series on Supergirl and a YA series of Clue novels. And Russ has also worked on novelty books and board books. Mark. Evan here. Mark, you're this new kid on the block, but from what I can tell, you're you're sort of kind of a big deal. Um, so I'm glad to have you here. And you actually are a big deal. I know that because I've known you for over 30 years. And, and that's a, that's quite enough, I think. That's it. Let's end it right. <laughs> let's end it right here in honor of the Comic Con. <laughs> Probably be better for everybody, but I do want to say he's a comic book writer and historian. He's written more than 500 comics for Gold Key, DC Comics, Marvel Comics, and other major publishers, including Rue the Wanderer with uh, somebody named Sergio Aragones, another new kid, right? Yeah. Um, uh, you've written several hundred hours of television, including Welcome Back, Cotter, and The Garfield Show, and several books which I had the honor of editing, including Mad Art, Kirby King of Comics, and The Art of Simon Kirby Studio. Uh, Mark has three Emmy Award nominations, multiple Eisner and Harvey Awards, including one Eisner and two Harveys for Kirby King of Comics. And in 2003, he received the Lifetime Achievement Award for animation from the Writers Guild of America. Uh, I think, Mark, you just have to keep at it, and hopefully things will break for you. Someday. Yeah, you think I'd have a couple of bucks, wouldn't you? You know, it's amazing. <laughs> and myself, I'm just the editorial director of Abrams Comic Arts. My name is Charles Kochman. I edit the Diary of a Wimpy Kid, ser Wimpy Kid series and several hundred books on comics and comics history. So I want to welcome you to our panel, which is called Make Mine Marvel, bringing back Marvel classics for today's readers. And I wanted to start just, you know, we're really excited at Abrams because, you know, Russ and I work at Abrams and we get to work on Marvel books, which has been a dream since we were kids. Uh, and the relationship with Marvel and DC goes back quite a long way, actually. In 1991, we did a book called uh, uh, Five Fabulous Decades. Uh, it was written by Les Daniels. Um, and that was sort of, the, at that time, the 50th anniversary definitive history of Marvel Comics. Um, and I just sort of, I love those pictures of Stan reading the book because it's sort of, you know, um, I remember when that book came out, that was the first chance I got to really, really dive into the history in that way. So um, Lauren, I just want to ask, start off with you for a second and just sort of talk about why, why these Marvel characters still matter um, all these years later. I think it's not just that they still matter, but really that they matter more now than they ever have. Um, I think, Marvel is filled with folklore mythology and specifically folklore mythology that's really created for our time. And as our presence in pop culture has expanded through our film, TV, movies, and games, um, there's an even larger audience for Marvel, uh, Marvel's timeless lessons that real people can be heroes and that just because you're a hero doesn't mean you aren't perfect. I think Peter Parker is the perfect example. He's kind of your everyman hero. Uh, he makes mistakes from his inception to um, to present day where where really he's a human even before he's Spider-Man a lot of times. And I think that kind of accessibility is what really makes these characters important uh, for today's readers. And do you think, you know, as a, as an editor over at Marvel, I mean, obviously it feels like, you know, we have a you know, big anniversary this year. Um, this is, which which anniversary, just to clarify for people? 60th, I believe. Yeah. I really I really hope this, this feels like a pop quiz all of a sudden. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> but it is our 60th. Um, no, but it feels like, you know, like 60 years and, and just between all the movies and all the publishing, mm -hmm. you know, here's a slide of just some of the books that we're publishing now. We're just one publisher out of many that you work with. But, um, you know, what I like is that for us at Abrams, we have an overview here of like different formats. We have uh, these uh, 
uh, sort of my first, what are the, the mighty, my first mighty Marvel books. Uh, they're board books for younger readers. We have a sticker book, which is a retro sticker book, but it's also for kids as well as adults. A reprint of the Marvel mini books in this box set and the uh, Marvel value stamps. And it's sort of a little bit for, for older readers nostalgia wise and for younger readers who are coming up, these are their first Marvel books. So I kind of like that we're offering something for everybody there. Um, Mark, do you want to, as we sort of segue into the next slide and the next, um, you know, the first book that we'll talk about, the Marvel mini books, you want to talk a little bit about Marvel publishing and, and some of the books that have been done over the years and, and where Marvel mini books would fit into all that? Well, Marvel mini books take me back to a time in the 60s when I was avidly collecting Marvel. And at that point, and this is going to sound very ludicrous to anybody who's been buying Marvel books for the last, in the last 20 or 30 years, to be a Marvel reader was to buy everything, everything that had the Marvel name on it. At that point, it was not that expensive. Um, you could buy every Marvel comic that came out during the month for a, like under a buck and a half. And the limited merchandise that came around added maybe another buck or two average to the month. So you could be a collector of every single thing Marvel, sometimes with Millie the model thrown in for a couple of bucks a month. And even, you know, at, at, at the age of 14, I could manage three or four bucks a month. I was also spent buying all the DCs and all the, the tower comics and all the Charlton's as well. But there was not a lot of Marvel merchandise in the sixties. Um, even after the Marvel superheroes cartoon shows came on, there was only a kind of a limited amount of it, but it was all kind of fun stuff. And a lot of it came out of the Marvel bullpen. A lot of it was when there was new content to be created, it was created by the Marvel writers and artists and no better example exists than the Marvel comics, many books, which they did, which, um, these are, there were six of them and, um, you know, I had to have them. Now, oddly enough, these books are each very tiny. Um, we have a shot here that compares them to the size of a penny. That is basically what they were. They are not the greatest reads in the world. How could they be with you know the limited amount of words there and the limited amount of pictures? But they were Marvel merchandise, so we all had to have them. And these are the only ones, the only Marvel comics, that in order to get them, you had to gamble. You had to go to gumball machines and keep pumping in in some cases nickels i the only machine i could find took quarters and hope that what came out of the machine was a marvel mini book that you needed as opposed to a marvel mini book you already had or a mini a non-marvel <laughs> mini book or a plastic whistle or a little top or a silly sticker there's a lot of non-marvel stuff in all those gumball machines but I uh, found a store in Los Angeles that had a machine that, that had them housed and they were in these little plastic egg type things and it was a quarter a piece. And I stood there. Uh, if you ever go to Las Vegas and you see somebody at a slot machine who's there for like three days in a row with, with three days growth of beard, even a woman who's just pumping coins in and pulling the handle and pumping coins in and will not leave for anything, that was me trying to amass my collection of Marvel mini books. And in this set, box set that comes out, there is an there are the six reproductions of the six mini books that existed, and then there is a seventh mini book which tells the mini history, which uh, I wrote, being paid with a mini check, <laughs> and they and I tell the story of all of the trauma I went through to c get my collection. Spoiler alert: I did get them all, and. Uh, I felt like an enormous ac accomplishment. I wouldn't have felt like a Marvel reader at that time if I didn't have all of these dumb little tiny books that you couldn't read without the pages coming on stage. Probably one of the advantages of these reproductions is they won't fall apart the minute you open them. Will they, Charlie? <laughs> they will not. They will Good. Not. <laughs> I can so, now, so, Mark, you came in yeah. six colors. So each yeah. character came in six colors. You didn't collect all six colors. No, no, no. Uh, they they uh, printed, actually, they printed them in more than six colors. I think the second press run had psychedelic colors and patterns sometimes in the covers. They they printed them in black ink on whatever paper was lying around. So some of the covers were printed on orange stock and some on blue stock. So you can get the six different books. You could get the six different books you know, you can get all orange ones, you can get all green ones, all yellow ones. Uh, I was I was willing to settle for just one of each, regardless of the color schemes on them. 
uh, and this and you, the machine you're seeing here had it was a dime. I wish I'd found a dime machine because I had to pump quarters into, into into the machine to get mine. So so the full size Marvel comic book at that time, the regulation Fantastic Four Hulk you bought, whatever it was, Spider Man. Hulk didn't have his own comic at the time yet. Um, was twelve cents, and the little tiny one, the size of a of a penny was for me some of them cost a buck and a half or so because that's how many quarters i had to pump in before i got one uh so it was very traumatic and i stood there at the gumball machine for hours on end and pumping in all these quarters and and trying desperately to get the last one so i could just get this monkey off my back and i thought someday someone will pay me to write a box set <laughs> of these books and they will be collector's items and and I don't even know what this book this set sells for, but I probably spent more to get you know just the Captain America mini book than the cost of this box set. Yeah, I think we're twenty four ninety nine. No, not even. We're like sixteen ninety nine, something like that. Oh, that's a bargain. Yeah, I would have. I would have. I wish I could have just paid sixteen ninety nine back then and gotten this box set. Also, they're a little larger, I believe. And, and yeah, we enlarged uh, them a little bit. Yeah. So. Uh, um, yeah. And then one last question for you about the mini books too. These were done by a, a company called CHP, which was Creative House Promotions, and they did yes. lots of things at the time. But when you were writing this book, not much was known about these books, and like you did a lot of detective work, not only to see who drew them, but also to who, who wrote them. And yes, I, yeah. Um, the art, the artists are not difficult to, to discern from the styles. Marie Severin wrote, drew most of them, uh, and a couple of other people pitched in, but the writing was a problem. Because at that time, Marvel had on had only four people writing their comic books: Stan Lee, Roy Thomas, Denny O'Neill, and Larry Lieber. So I kind of ruled out that Stan had done. I called Roy, and he said he had not written any of them, and he was pretty sure Stan had not written any of them. Stan didn't have the. This is not something that Stan would have spent his time on. So I called Larry, and he didn't remember if he had or not. He said I probably wrote some of them. I don't know. And then I called Denny O'Neill, who unfortunately now is the late Denny O'Neill, but I talked to him a few months ago and he brightened up so much when I asked him this because it turns out that he wrote the Captain America one and it was the first superhero comic story he ever wrote in his life. He had been writing Millie the Model and books like that for Marvel to then, and I think he did a Western script or two, but he was asked by whom he does not remember to write one of these and he sat down and in two hours or so wrote the Captain America book uh, and just had a wonderful time doing it. And we had talked about the possible, I said, say, I guess nobody ever asked you to autograph one of them. And he said, no, nobody knew I did them. This is, he said, I haven't even thought about it myself in whatever it is, 50 years, 50 years, 55 years. Uh, and, uh, I said, well, you know, you'd have to use a really tiny pen to autograph these books. <laughs> and he volunteered the idea that when this set came out, um, we would send him a couple sets and he would, and I would send him my Captain America book and he would autograph it to me. And, it, and, I, and that would be the only one he ever signed. I would have the only Captain America book, a uh, mini book uh, signed by its author. And um, that is not the reason I'm sad that Denny passed away not long ago. But um, it's got to be in the back of my head, like, oh, you couldn't have waited a few months. <laughs> Come on, you couldn't wait till you you couldn't have waited till you signed my book. No. Uh, so I, uh, I didn't get to send him a copy of the box set. He was excited that it was happening, and he did get to see a PDF, which he really liked. So that was good. Good. That that's good. Yes. You know, it's they're they're very great little treasures of a in, more innocent time. Uh, they're examples of. Uh, the, the fanishness that was around Marvel Comics back then. There was a feeling that you, even, you know, even, even before, there were no conventions at that time. There were really not many fanzines anywhere. And, they, and none of them had much circulation. But, the, but just by buying Marvel Comics and reading the bullpen page, you had a strong sense of belonging to the Marvel thing. And, and I, I was in a comic book club at the time. And our members all were collecting these things and swapping them out. I mean, you you know, you go to the machines and you put in lots of coins and eventually you'd wind up with, you know, nine copies of the Hulk and no copy of Sergeant Fury. So you come to the meeting and you swap out. And this, most of us completed our collections at the comic club meetings by swapping out you know, copies of the mini books. And once you had all six of them, you would 
there was this deep exhale because you went, ah, oh, I'm complete now. My, I am a true Marvel fan, and um, I have these books. They were like a badge of honor. Well, I'm really excited that you were part of this and 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 helped make it possible. All those stories that you told are in the book. In the uh, we have a, a bonus seventh book that comes in the book that tells all of the background and history that Mark uncovered in in writing this. Um, and that's a good segue to the next books that we we're going to talk about, which are these uh, my first Marvel, uh, my mighty Marvel first books. Which uh, Russ, uh, you want to talk a little bit about? These are board books for younger readers. Um, yeah, the, the uh, My Mighty Marvel first books, because um, alliteration is the best. Uh, we launched with Spider-Man and uh, Captain America. Um, basically, the thought behind them was to take um, legendary artists and use their art to indoctrinate the, uh, the next generation of Marvel fans. Um, so the thought is really, this is kind of like a passing of the torch. It's parents showing um, their kids these characters for the first time. Um, so it's really, it's back to basic stuff. Um, the Spider-Man book, we were lucky enough to pull from um, John Romita. Um, and really this is Spider-Man at his most pure. He's not a sad sack in this book, really. He's just, he's, he has his perseverance and, um, you know, Gwen and Mary Jane can exist on the same page just dancing without getting into the heavier stuff. It's really just, it's bright, amazing fun for, for really babies and the youngest readers. Um, but we did put in these um, these bios at the end for collectors and adults that are really like, man, I grew up reading the John Romita comics. Um, I'm so happy to be sharing this with my kids, and, you know, my friend's kids, but also there's a little bit extra for them. And it's, you know, now it's educational as, as well as as well as bright and fun. And these books are written as if, if you knew nothing about the characters, obviously this is like your first introduction to them. Right. It's very, um, you know, for the Captain America, we used uh, Jack Kirby art, which was amazing to flip through and find, find pieces. Um, but it's very much, this is Steve Rogers and he's, he's the best man. You're going to love him. It's a, uh, it's an introduction to friends and foes uh, without really um, getting too much into canon. Um, it's really a first introduction. Um, so here we, you know, we picked some some splash art and another bio of Jack Kirby here. Um, and something that we got to do that I thought was a lot of fun was each book has three gatefolds in it. Uh, so you know, you start here, meet Spider-Man, and then in the next slide you see you can flip over that page and get a little bit more information. Um, for the Captain America one, we started with Cap and Bucky and use it as an opportunity to sneak in some Avengers with an, with an up flap. Um, so it is really like it's an interactive thing that uh, I think parents and kids are really going to love to flip through together. Um, with the added bonus of like, we get to work with Jack Kirby. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I have to say when I, when I share these books with our team in-house at Marvel and I get to say, hey, look at all the pretty things we're doing on the kids' side, this, these board books are always the things that other editors and everyone else uh, in like our marketing team are so excited about just from a fan perspective because they love the original art and it really kind of reminds them of their childhood a lot of times, but also they're so excited to share it with kids. And I think that's the most special thing about these board books is it gets parents excited to share it with the next generation because it's something that they, they really have fond memories with. That's cool. Yeah, I'm excited by these. You have other books coming too. Oh, here's the full line. Yep. Um, we, we've got a ton, uh, but the, the next three for fall are going to be Black Widow uh, to tie into the new movie, uh, Black Panther, and The Hulk um, by John and Sal Buscema. That's cool. Now, have we announced those before, or is this an exclusive? For um, this is an exclusive, I believe. <laughs> this is the first time we're talking about them. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Now, those are great. Those are great. I love, I love the fact that some of the books that we're doing especially, you know, books like this where you can give it to kids. I always have this problem where, um, you know, when I was when I was growing up, it's like you want to, like, you don't have time to buy 20 issues of a comic. You want one issue where you can understand everything or, right. a book that, you know, and a lot of the stuff when I was a kid wasn't written for us. It was written for adults. But, you know, we'll take, we, like Mark, Mark was saying with the mini books, just take whatever you can get. 
but it's nice to create these things for kids and have them in mind, but also that adults can um, play with as well. And that sort of segues into the next book, which is the Marvel Classic Sticker Book. Um, and this is a, a book that we're doing that we put together in house. It's sort of a, um, a, a book for kids, but it also has this real retro feel and retro appeal. Um, it includes the top stickers that were done in 75 and 76. Um, you know, these are some of the really iconic stickers from my childhood. And then we included also the Philadelphia Chewing Gum set, which is the next slide is uh, from, these are from 67. So these are earlier than that, a little bit a uh, year after the Marvel mini books. But then these were like, you know, stickers that, you know, occasionally I would find one or two in a, in a store or they would be on the bottom of a box in a comic book store or a, a, not a comic book store, they didn't have them back then, but like a, like a, uh, hardware store or wherever I would buy my comics when I was a kid. So we have some of, some of us found all of them, Charlie. <laughs> some of us bought every one of these. Yeah, but you and had and I, and I still too. have them. I still have them. Yeah, I love these stickers. I was really glad we, we included the Philadelphia Chewing Gum ones in here. Um, and then we also um, included on the next slide, we have these Marvel Mania. Uh, no, these are some of the logos that are in there. Uh, we also did the little uh, character heads that are in there, but also on the next slide, we have the Marvel Mania posters that came out in 69 and 70 uh, that were done by Jack Kirby. So these are full pullout posters that are in the book. And then you, there are five of these posters. And then when you pull them out on the other side is a, a little comics grid. So you could draw your own comics. You could put your stickers on it and kids could make their own comics. Um, so again, it's another book like like the um, My Mar My Mar Mighty Marvel First Books where you know they're for kids, but also for adults. And there's this crossover appeal. Um, and collecting that. So we're really excited to pull that together. Um, and we have one more book we want to talk about, and then we'll have a little more general discussion. But the next one's Marvel Value Stamps. And uh, this is a book that's near and dear to my heart because um, as a kid in 1974, when these came out, um, I was a DC fan at the time. My brother was a Marvel fan. Um, and when I saw the Marvel Value Stamps, because I collected stamps because my grandfather collected stamps, all of a sudden I became a Marvel fan. Um, and much to my brother's dismay, if you go to the next slide, these were these were books that, um, stamp albums, there was one in 74 and the next one in 75, the one on the right is, uh, the red one came, came second. Um, and you would mail in for this book, and then what you would do is, on the letters pages of the Marvel comics, there would be a little Marvel stamp, and you would cut that out, and then on the next slide you'll see, uh, you, um, you would put them into your book. Um, and you have to understand that I didn't have any Marvel books, but my brother did. So I cut up all his comics and put them into this book. So what you're seeing here is this a scan of my, my copy. Um, and Silver Age comics from this period that are missing this, you know, they, they go from, you know, being worth 10 or $15,000 to several hundred dollars if they're missing the Marvel value stamp, uh, cause they're folks like me. But, uh, what, what I like about this is this was an idea that, well, actually, Mark, do you want to talk? A, do you know a little bit of background on this? Uh, somebody said to somebody else, "We can sell more comics if we make kids buy two to so they can cut one up." I think that's the uh, that, the premise of it. That was Stan's idea, and um, and it was really kind of revolutionary. And Roy Thomas, who uh, wrote the the text in this book and helped us put it together, uh, was working for Stan at the time. I think as his editor in chief, um, and and helped find the art with in the bullpen with some people like. Uh, Marie Severn and people. So if you go to the next slide, what you'll see is um, we show the letters page. So on the left, you'll see that's where the stamp was and you would cut that out. And then on the right, what we do for the first time is we show where that image came from. So there you see where the Iron Man stamp art came from. Um, the second series, which is on the next slide, was a little more complicated. Instead of doing individual images, they took up uh, the image on the left was uh, comprised, comprised of uh, 10, 10 stamps that when you put together formed uh, an image. Um, so, you know, on the right, you see where that, where that comic book uh, uh, image of Spider-Man and everybody came from. It was a, an issue of Spider-Man. Um, and I was really excited because the last slide, the last image, which we don't have here, but it was an image, um, blank image you get to put together of um, a face. And it, the caption was that this person holds the, the entire Mo Marvel universe in the palm of his hands and he controls the destinies of everybody. And you had to put in all the stamps to figure out who it was. And we speculated it was Galactus or, or um, you know, different people. But it turned out it was Stan Lee uh, when you put it together. Um, 
and I got to meet him when I was a kid and he signed my book and I told him that I figured out that he was the last person. He patted me on the head and thanked me. And that was like literally like the best home run that you could have had as a kid to get a pat on the head from Stan and, uh, and congratulate you for figuring out this Marvel clue. Um, so I want to talk a little bit general. We have a little bit more time just to, those are the books that we're publishing, but um, you know, we started out talking a little bit about, you know, why Marvel now and um you know i wonder like we all approach marvel from a different part of our childhood and i think you know lauren you know for you were you a marvel fan as a kid a comic book fan because now you're working at marvel comics and you're one of the custodians of these characters like how does that feel sometimes the mantle feels heavy i my big thing with children's comics and graphic novels and just any kind of marvel content for kids is that I wasn't as familiar with it growing up. I wasn't a comic book reader at all. I think I read my first comic book like end of high school, maybe even college, uh, which is really a travesty. So my goal at Marvel is to make sure that no one ever has that happen to them. They always have kind of an entry point that they can easily reach to and find our characters and find our universe and enter through that doorway, um, whether it's for through like a board book or a graphic novel or even one of like the comic books that we do with IDW that are geared towards kids. I think creating creating those pathways, um, a lot of people don't know where to start and entering a comic book store can be really daunting. Uh, you don't have big spines uh, really beckoning you. It's not kind of siloed or it hasn't been siloed into like what's for kids. Uh, and there's always that kind of catch all phrase of um, all ages publishing. And a lot of what I do is while all ages uh, stories are great, I really want to carve out what is for younger readers. What can younger readers immediately point to and be like, that? that's for me. I see myself in that. Um, this is where I entered the Marvel Universe. I love that idea because I think that if you if you hit kids right, um, those kids, they, their love of these characters will stay with them for their life. And they become not just, you know, even if they're not just Marvel fans, they become comic book fans because mm -hmm. they got introduced to stories. I think um, I remember when I was at DC, somebody said something about, you know, they didn't like comics. They just couldn't understand them. Uh, and one of the editors said, it's not that you can't understand them. You just can't understand bad comics. And if you, like, you know, and I think that's true. It's like a lot of times, like some comics are so obtuse and they shouldn't, you, comics shouldn't be work, you know, mm -hmm. the books that you're working on, uh, you know, and the books that you're doing, yes, those are books that, you know, kids could embrace and read and understand. And I think that's really important. And I mean, I think what what Marvel has done with characters like Miss Marvel when they created her, I think that was the first time I ever walked into a bookstore, saw the trade of Miss Marvel, saw the cover and was like, oh, okay, this looks like an this looks like a starting point. Maybe I don't need to know so much about the comics. This this is a very clear volume slash issue one. Uh same with um, Rainbow Rowell's uh, run of the Runaways. Like, even though there there was a uh, Kurt Vaughn's Runaways before, you can start with Rainbow Rowell's, and everything's explained to you, and you don't really have to know a whole ton to really get into that comic. I think that's probably one of my first comics I ever read that I couldn't put down. And Rainbow Rowell, like, she knows how to talk to teens. She gets that teen reader, and you know, I'm a 30 year old woman loving loving those teen stories. So it was definitely felt like it was written for me. Oh, that's awesome. Now, you, yeah, I think that's great. Russ, how about you? Like when you were growing up, did you ever expect that you would get to work on books about Marvel characters? Um, no, like at all. I, uh, when I was a kid, I wasn't really, I wasn't a reader. Um, but we had the summer reading goals. So my mom would take me to the library, you know, check something out, hit your goals. Um, and I remember finding out that like you could check out comic books and they'll count for your goals. Uh, <laughs> So my very first one was, I think, was uh, J. Michael Kubinski and John Romita Jr.'s, um, one of their volumes of Spider-Man. Mm -hmm. And like, I fell in love with it. So I spent the rest of my childhood and up till now just like devouring Spider-Man um, and like kind of expanding, expanding. And now I get to work, you know, with with John Romita's art. <laughs> and, um, so like, I don't often, I call my parents about work stuff because they're busy. But like for for these, it's so exciting to like edit and and write with and come up with these with these concepts um, for these characters that have been like so 
ingrained in me. And, like I'm, I'm so excited to, uh, to like give it to the, to the next generation. You know? Yeah, and you're about to be a father. That must be really exciting that you have these books that you'll be able to share with your kids. Yeah, yeah, that kid has no chance of not. <laughs> like that's day one. Yeah. And Mark, you started with what? It was a uh, new new fun number one. Uh, I uh, um, I tell people that the doctor slapped me when I was born, and I dropped a copy of Walt Disney's comics and stories I was reading in the womb. Uh, I've been reading comic books my whole life. I read Dell and Disney and that, that kind of comic for a while. I segued to DC Comics when Marvel started publishing superheroes. I started buying them. I ne I didn't generally give up the 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 previous interest, I just kept amassing comic books to the point where when I was 15, I had more comic books than everybody I knew put together. Uh, my whole room was filled with them. I had built big shelves for them. I filed them and organized them back when, you know, nobody, nobody else did that. Um, and, uh, and I never thought I would get into the comic book field really, because I knew it was largely based in New York and I was based in Los Angeles and I had no desire to leave Los Angeles, but through a strange quirk, uh, which involved meeting uh, some guy named Jack Kirby, I started working in comic books. And I did not, when I was reading these comics, dream I'd ever know someone like Jack Kirby or Stan Lee, let alone work for both of them. I'm the only person alive, I believe, who worked for both Stan and Jack at different mm -hmm. times and got to know them and worked with them and uh, I, I actually am one of those people who is fascinated, l less fascinated by Superman and Spider-Man than I am by Stephen Schuster and Steve Ditko and Stan and Jack. I'm mm -hmm. interested in the people, I think, more than the, 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 but I'm also interested in the impact that their work had on people because it is, it is formidable. And we have now reached the period of time where you have generations introducing new generations to the things they loved when they were kids. There probably somewhere is out there right now someone who is teaching their grandparents about the comics they loved when they were kids and their 1960s Marvels. Mm -hmm. And and I felt, felt privileged to be a witness as that foundation was built. I bought the first you know, Daredevil off the stands when it first came out. I bought the first, I don't think I bought the first Fantastic Four, but I had it soon after it came out. And... Uh, and I watched all these books develop and I watched them change and evolve. And on one hand, I look at them like I look at the LA Dodgers now. I go, that's not the Dodgers. Where's Candy Koufax? Where's Maury Wills? Where's all those guys who played for them when I was watching, you know, baseball in the 60s? On the other hand, I look at the timelessness of these characters, the fact they do endure as they get handed from writer to writer to artist to writer all the years. And they even endure the really lousy writers and artists that they, most of them occasionally have along the way. There's something about them that endures and it triumphs over somebody taking them off in bizarre directions. And, and there's something very primal about the characters. Uh, and every couple of years, you know, somebody goes, let's get back to basics. Let's go back to the original concept of these things. And, and I was there when the original concepts happened. And I feel... Uh, a certain possessiveness about having this, you know, there's, there's, there's millions of people in this world who know, who, who know that oh, Tony Stark was Iron Man. I knew when I was 14 and you'd, and you'd never heard of Iron Man. Uh, I got in on that and I still have the bizarre, you know, uh, thing in my memory where if you say to me, Fantastic Four number 13, I go, yeah, that's the red ghost. It was inked by Steve Ditko and lettered by Artie Simic and Stan and Jack wrote and drew it. So, I mean, I just, that's, I, I can't remember a thing from my college classes at UCLA. I don't remember a word. Of, I took, I took two years of uh, German and I don't remember a word of German that doesn't, that doesn't relate to things that are on a, um, you know, knock words that's on a menu. But I remember, you know, who inked each of these comics and who drew them and, and which issue the Silver Surfer first appeared in. And so it's just part of my life. And, uh, uh, if we pan this camera around this house, you'd see a lot of Marvel original art and posters and things on the uh, the uh, on the walls. I mean, I do think there's something to be said for comics being the greatest shared storytelling experience ever created. Well, it's 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 a unique American art form. 
There's a few others like jazz, which people could argue for, but comic books really got birthed in America. And, and they are very American in their heritage. And you can, we can spend an hour here that we don't have talking about how the superhero uh, model relates to the, the time in which it was born of the forties and, and going off to fight the Nazis and such. But um, it's something that is wonderful. And I hate terms like pop culture, but it's accessible culture. It's things that people can, can, can catch on to very quickly. Um, and I love that you're doing these entry level books here where somebody can get up, get a little basics on Spider-Man in one sitting with a book that tells them the, the, the broad strokes of the, of the characters. Uh, and, uh, uh you know, there's a reason that these things have endured, and it's the reason we're here now. It's the reason you're putting these books out, Charlie, because these characters have a life and a, a popularity, and people are possessive about them. I, I used to go to parties when I was a teenager or even in my, a young adult, and people would say, what do you do? And I'd go, and, uh, oh, I write comic books, and they all lit up, and they say, oh, did you ever meet Stan Lee? Did you, do you know Jack Kirby? Did, now, you know about the Silver Surfer? I mean, people, even people who'd stop reading these comics considered them them important parts of their childhood, and they, they never turned loose of that. A lot of the reason that movie studios make movies about Marvel, like Ant-Man or whatever it is, is, they, the, is the working premise, which is not wrong, that people who loved Ant-Man when they were kids will go to see this and take their whole families and introduce their kids to Ant-Man or to Captain America or to the Black Widow or any of these characters. They, they cross, they transcend generations. Yeah, I think that's the secret. And I think that it's a truism for music or movies and certainly for comics that whatever you encountered as a kid, that was the golden age for you. Those are the best, you know? And I think that, you know, why I'm excited about, you know, the books that we're, we're putting out now is that it's an opportunity to introduce characters to what will be their golden age of comics. Um, every generation gets to make these characters their own. Um, we're running out of time. We're out of time. Uh, this would normally be where we would ask questions, but since uh, there is no audience, it's just us, uh, we will not, not ask, ask questions. But I want to thank you all for being part of this and for bringing your passion to these books and, and your love of comics to it. It's really it makes the difference between you know good books and great books, and you can see it on these pages. So thank you for being a part of this, and uh, I'll talk to you all soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.